Well, welcome to the channel. It's uh, it's Tuesday. It's about 11:30 in the morning, and I'm up here in the city. I'm gonna walk around a little bit and uh, show you what's going on. It's pretty busy up here today. But uh, I want to thank everybody. We hit 7,000 subscribers this this morning at about 8 o'clock, which is I want to thank everybody that's joined the channel, left comments, clicked like, and, and uh, talked to me. It really makes me feel good to, to know that people are enjoying the content. Today I've got a really good story for you. It's, it's one that I did myself. It's a case that I started from the, the very beginning and followed it through all the way to the end. Uh, it's kind of a sad story, but in the end, you know, it's, it is what it is. And, uh, a lot of twists and turns to it and a lot of surprises that, uh, that I found out along the way working the case. But uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get walking. I'm just going to walk around the, uh, the inside of the moat on the outer lane because it's, it's hot. It's about 35 degrees Celsius today. Uh, the PM 2.5 is about 15 and uh, I want to try to stay in the shade. And I'm going to try not to get distracted. Uh, you know, everybody's complaining, well, you stop here, you stop there, and, and you stop the story. I'm going to try to continue to tell the story, you know, in, in, in sequence and, and not, uh, you know, not interrupt myself. But anyway, I'm going to turn the camera around and we'll get walking. A lot of people out today. This, uh, this story I'm going to tell you about happened back in 2002. It was February of 2002, as I remember, as I remember it correctly. And uh, that particular day, it was, it was real cold. It was in the middle of winter, uh, just kind of a miserable, miserable cold day. And I had been in the office all day. I had been working on, on uh, financial reports to send to the federal government, trying to explain to them how, uh, how my boss had spent $150,000 worth of uh, federal grant money. To their likings and uh, it was kind of a task it took me all day and by the time I finished up it was about seven o'clock that night I walked down the stairs and walked out and all the lights were off and everybody was gone I was the only one there and uh, you know just I was just glad to, to get out and get away from it and I uh, jumped in my car turned the heater on drove home and you know it's just a nice peaceful relaxing drive home um, I lived way out in the country and there was like a, a four-lane highway going out to my house and, and uh, I'd turn off of one road and I lived it, it out in the country at a dead-end road. It was, you know, it's just a peaceful, peaceful drive home. Got home, peeled off my clothes and, and just kind of relaxed and sat back. By this time, it's probably about nine o'clock, sit down to eat dinner and uh, play with my son for a little while. And next thing you know, this is probably how... Oh, Probably about 10 o'clock, the phone rings. And, you know, nobody ever calls me that night. Anytime anybody calls me at 10 o'clock at night, it's something not good. And, I, you know, I pretty much knew that uh, my night was going to be ruined. And anyway, I pick up the phone, and sure enough, we'd had a homicide. Or, shoot, let's put it this way, it was put to me, we had a shooting and we had one guy dead. So, uh, at the time, I had 14 people working for me. I had uh, four drug detectives, I had two child abuse investigators, and then I had eight guys that basically picked up the slack and did everything else. And everybody was cross-trained. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I did when I took over the detective division, I made sure that every detective was, was trained to investigate any type of crime that could happen. So if they got called out to something like that, you know, they, they were, they were capable of handling it and that paid off in the long run because you know it just when you when you call people in you knew they could handle the job and I had I had handpicked these people and, and they were really really good so uh, I knew that my uh, my lieutenant who was also my crime scene investigator he lived closer than I did so I knew he'd beat me there so I jump in the car and I didn't you know I Situations like that, I, I don't really, you know, I didn't, I didn't turn on the lights and siren or anything like that. I just, you know, they're going to be there when I get there. And uh, drove up to the to the house, and the house was it was in an area of town that was, I wouldn't say it was low class, but uh, it was right at the right at the edge of the city, and the city 
would never annex that road. And we used to get a lot of calls out there. And I knew mo mostly everybody that lived on that street. I had dealt with them at one time or another. But this particular house I'd never been to. And I pulled up and I was greeted by the shift lieutenant. And uh, he basically tells me, he says, you got, you got a, a man inside, dead, laying in the front room with a bullet hole in his back. And uh, when I got here, she, she came up to the car and said she'd shot him. So I cuffed her and put her in the car. And that was pretty much all I really knew from that point. And I went ahead and I took a quick look inside the car and got a look at her. She was sitting in there, the air conditioner was running, or the heater was running. And uh, I wanted to kind of assess what I had. And uh, I had called in three or four of my other guys to come down, and, and they finally showed up. And I went on inside. The, my crime scene investigator was already inside. And uh, you walked in the front door, and I'll show you a picture of the place right up there. That's the, that's the house, and, and the actual location is the trailer off to the right that you see there. And uh, I had pulled into that driveway. And... Uh, Anyway, I walk inside. I walk inside the, the house, and uh, you have to turn to the right to get to the bedroom. It's just one small door. And sure enough, uh, laying face down in front of the bed was a body. A guy about, uh, he, he's about 35 years old. And uh, it was a gun on the bed. The bed was made. Room, room wasn't messed up. Uh, you know, everything was was pretty much in order and uh, we looked around a little bit we found two spent casings in the room in the short time that I was there and, and they were off in a kind of an odd direction there was actually two two different directions that the casings had fell which is kind of odd and uh, anyway I I left the place with uh, with my crime scene investigator and I, I told him I said if you find anything call me and I went back outside, and I had uh, I had the lieutenant transport her to our our offices, and I had my other two guys follow him. And uh, told one of them, I said, "You sit there in the room with her," and the other guy set up the video surveillance, uh, you know, where I could record the interview. So uh, I hung around for a few minutes and, and looked around and her mother, her mother who lived in the house right in front of the trailer came out and just, you know, just said, oh, he's been beating on her. He's done this. He's done that. And, you know, he's he's just uh, just a bad guy. And apparently they had they were separated and they had been, been separated for a few months and they had also been married twice they got married right out of high school and that got annulled they both married other people and had children she had a daughter and he also had a daughter and then those two relationships fell apart and they got married again so you know there was a history there but anyway I left the uh, I left the scene and I got to the to our uh, to our offices and our offices you know we, we were we were a growing department at the time and, and we had kind of grown out of being at the actual justice center and what they had done is they had bought an old two-story house that was right behind the justice center and uh, fixed it up and those were our offices and it worked out real well I mean we had plenty of space we had plenty of office space uh, you know, it was pretty private. I had an interview room set up, which is something that we hadn't had for a long time. And uh, so I walked in. I made sure that my two guys were at the were manning the the monitors of the the video equipment, and everything was working. The tape recorder was working. The video camera was working, and we were getting good sound. And I told both of them, I said, "Stay in front of the monitor." I said, "You know, I said I'm going to go in and interview her." But I want you guys out here watching and listening, which they were. You know, they were they were standing right there, and it was kind of a 
it was an open area. You walked in the front door of, the, of our offices and directly to the left was the interview room. And then you walked into a big open space. Well, they had set the, the, uh, the equipment up in the, in the, you know, in the wide open space. And one guy was still sitting in with her and uh, I had him come out and the other guy was running the tape machine. So I walked in and, you know, I, I read her rights, which is something that I, I do with everybody and uh, had her sign a rights waiver form and it was no problem. And I be the way I do my interviews is I usually get them to tell the story three times. The first time, I let them tell it. I just let them spill it out, whatever they're going to tell me. And, uh, and then, you know, we'll take about a two or three minute break, get some water or something, and then I'll have them tell it again. And, and I do this for one reason, especially in a, in a situation where the, the incident has just occurred and they've not been able to form a thought press process of what actually happened or you know come up with some type of story that sounds legitimate that they think they'll get by with well I had uh, I had a little, little bit of time lapse there and, and she had pretty much come up with a story well I start my interview and you know I get through the first part of the interview and I'm, I'm outside and I get a phone call and it turns out that the first call came in at 9.30 and it wasn't from her. It was from her boyfriend. She had a boyfriend that was pretty much the catalyst of all these tr problems that they were having. The husband was jealous of the boyfriend. And he is the one that actually called and reported that somebody had been shot. It turns out that the first per after she shot him, the first person she calls is the boyfriend. And he's telling her, call, call the police, call the police. Well, she won't do it. So he finally hangs up on her and calls 911. And uh, I hear this and I, I just, you know, I'm kind of floored. You know, this isn't something that normally happens. And I go back inside the room and I'm kind of, I'm kind of, you know, I'd already looked at her. She didn't, she didn't look like she'd been beaten up or didn't look like she was hurt. And then I started looking at her a little bit closer. And this is 9.30 at night. She's dressed to kill. She's got jeans on, clean shirt. And I look on top of her head and she's got sunglasses on the top of her head. And it just, it, you know, everything just kind of clicked right then. You know, she shot him and she was gonna haul ass. And uh, no doubt, I, I have no doubt. Um, so I went back in and, and I started my questioning again, and this time I would stop her in different aspects and, and you know, get her to explain a little bit. So we're talking and, and uh, she's telling me that basically her story was she had been at the hospital. Her father had ca terminal cancer and she had been at the hospital and he came up to the hospital, the ex-husband or the, the estranged husband. He came up to the hospital and he wasn't showing her any sympathy and just uh, being a real pain in the butt, she says. And uh, so when she left, then he shows up at the house, at their trailer. And she says he walks in and uh, he was also carrying, he was carrying a gun. And when we walked in the room, there, there was on the nightstand, or not actually it was the dresser and I'll try to draw a diagram there was a there was a holstered weapon right on the on the uh, on the dresser in front of the bed now we had the the gun on the dresser and then we had the gun on the bed so there's actually two guns in the room but his was just laying up, up on top of the dresser but she says he, he came in the house and uh, they were sitting on the couch and she was getting ready to go to bed and he was he was just you know being mean to her hitting her and pulling her hair and saying he was going to kill her and all this stuff and he wanted his gun back he had given her a beretta and she said he wanted his gun back so she says that she walked over to her mother's house, which is about probably 50, you, know, you can see it. She walks in the back door 
and uh, the gun was on top of the refrigerator. She gets the gun, walks back inside the house, and when she gets there, this and like I said, this is her story, he's sitting on the bed. So she says she sits down on the bed and they're sitting there talking. And again, she says that uh, he gets up and he says, "If you, if I can't have you, nobody had, nobody's gonna have you, and I'm gonna kill you and all this." And uh, she says he, he he starts to get up and she shoots him. Oh, and also by this time, my my investigator on the scene had told me when he called me that the shot in the back. When they rolled the guy over, there was a there was a bullet hole in his chest as well. So you know, right then, I mean, it's just it, things are just stinking real bad. I, you know, I know something's something's fishy here. So uh, she says she she shot him, and he kept coming towards her, and he shot she shot him again, and then she said, I said, well, why did you call your boyfriend and not call the police? She goes, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. The only person I knew to call was, was uh, Joey, who was her strange boy or her boyfriend at the time. And like I said, he's the one that actually called us. So I take the statement from her. I check her. I check her hair. You know, she, she didn't have any bruises on her, her arms, no scratches, uh, nothing under her fingernails. Just no, no marks at all. I mean, she looked like she was getting ready to dress to go out on the town. So uh, I finished the interview, and I, I wanted to go back in and pinpoint some more uh, points to her. But I wanted to give, give her just a little bit of a rest, and, and then I also wanted to walk back out to see if my guys had found, found out anything else while I was in there. And uh, when I walk out of the room... One of my guys who was watching the, uh, the monitor says, she's nothing but a damn cold-blooded killer. And I just kind of shook my head, you know, and, and uh, you know, agreed with him. Well, I finish up in, in the office room, and we're, we're watching her. And uh, I go back in to interview her again. This time... And I walk in, she goes, I heard that. I heard what he said. You all think I'm a cold-blooded killer. She goes, I want a lawyer. Well, the minute they say that, I have to stop talking to them. And I, I really, at that point in time, there, there really wasn't anything else she was going to tell me. So, you know, that I didn't already know. So I, I really wasn't too heartstruck about it. I was a little bit mad at my guys. They needed to keep their mouths closed. But uh, anyway... I said, that's fine, that's up to you. And uh, I called a patrol car to come over and pick her up, and they came and got her and, and took her to jail. And, you know, it was still things were going through in my mind. I knew, based on what I had, I knew I had, had a good second degree murder case against her. And that's what I charged her with. I charged her with second degree murder. And, uh, there were probably a few other charges that I could have thrown in there, but, you know, second-degree murder is a pretty stiff, stiff charge, and uh, I was comfortable with it. They took her off. I did the paperwork, booked her in, and I went back to the scene, and, and we, me and uh, Lieutenant, we are still poking around the house. There was nothing messed up in the house. Uh, you know, the, the bed was made. We found a nightgown next to the bed, that had a hole in it. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself that she probably walked over and got the gun from, from her mother's house, hid it underneath her, her nightgown and, and walked in and popped them. And I'm gonna cross the street and go over this way. We, uh, we sent the night gun off to the crime lab and they didn't find any traces of powder or anything like that on it. So we were pretty much, you know, we were pretty much stuck with what we had as far as that was concerned. So I went to the autopsy the next day and uh, 
the pathologist is a really good guy. He was an Indian guy. He, he did all of our autopsies at the hospital. And I hated going to those things because a lot of times we ate at the hospital and the damn morgue was right next to the hospital. And I swear that they probably used the same refrigerators to refrigerate the food that they refrigerated the bodies. But uh, when we started doing the autopsy, he started in the chest cavity and he pulls the bullet out and lays the skin skin out from the shot that uh, came from the back because it it had gone in his back and it had lodged underneath the skin in the chest area and there were was bruising on the bullet or on the on the skin in front of the uh, in front of the where the bullet was removed. Actually, I think I should have stayed on the other side. Yeah, we'll cross back again. So, uh, hello, well, I'm okay, thank you. So the doctor says, without a doubt, this shot was fired when he was laying on the floor. And it's probably the one that killed him because it took out quite a few organs as it came through. The shot that went through the chest he said was probably the first shot because of the amount of blood, but it was actually the second shot that, that, that killed him. There was too much blood on the, on the round, in the, around the round, round that went in through the back for him to not be alive when that shot was found. So that, you know, that put a whole new twist to things. Well, you know, the family is claiming domestic violence. The mother's calling me saying what a turd this guy was and, uh, you know, how he beat on her. Well, you know, the first thing that I do is I pull the, pull the records to see how many times we had been there. And we had only been there one time in seven years. And that was about a month before where he had gone over and he had wanted to get his gun back and she wouldn't give it to him and she ends up calling, uh, calling us to get him removed. And I talked to the officer that... Uh, that responded and uh, he had worked for me at one time so he you know he kind of knew the ropes and he said no he said I, I pulled up and talked to him and you know he said he wanted his gun and he wasn't getting his gun and I basically told him to leave and, and that's what he did he said he wasn't irate or you know mad or anything like that and uh, so I, I knew I knew that that was an issue that I was gonna have to face and I had pretty much covered my tracks beforehand because I had I'd looked at her face, I'd looked at her head, and it was all on videotape. I mean, you could see it. So, you know, I had to, I had to, I had to work that avenue of it just to eliminate that. And I, uh, I talked to a good friend of his who was his best friend, a guy by the name of Rodney. And uh, Rodney came in, I interviewed him, and Rodney tells me, that uh, the victim would spend the night at his house sometimes. She'd get so irate and, and uh, beat on him and, and scratch him and stuff that he, he'd escape to my house. A lot of times he slept on my couch. And uh, I asked him about the gun and he said, yeah, he had given her, given her the Beretta. And he, as a matter of fact, he was there when he gave it to her. And, uh, but he said, Brian, wasn't that type of a guy. He was very, very easy going. Uh, just a nice guy. And he said that she would just, she'd call him on the on his cell phone and just curse him and leave all kinds of nasty messages and all kinds of things. Well, I did get my hand on the cell phone from the parents. And sure enough, I played the messages back and I mean, she was just, it was unbelievable the things she was saying to him. And, and, and uh, accusing him of and it just it was really wild so seven days we, ha we have to have a preliminary hearing and that's where we have to go before a judge and pre present our evidence and uh, the judge makes a decision whether uh, there's enough evidence in the case to to uh, bind it over to the grand jury to go to trial. And uh, that day I showed up uh, 
my crime scene guy showed up and I believe the, uh, the medical examiner showed up and that was it. That's all we really needed. Um, she showed up. She had made bond. The judge said her bond something like $100,000 and her parents had made it. And she shows up and she's got this attorney out of, uh, out of Chattanooga. And I, a lot of these people, they thought if they hired a hired an out of, out of turn out of town attorney they were getting a better better deal well that's not always the case this guy had, I'm not sure how long he'd been practicing law I don't think it was very long uh, he was an ex-cop and those are those are some of the worst kind of yeah you know, just a uh, real cocky attitude and you know I'm game for that. <laughs> I'll deal with it all day long. So anyway, we got through the preliminary hearing. They put me on the stand. They put uh, put the medical examiner on the stand. The uh, the defense put her mother on the stand, who basically said that uh, she was aware that he'd beat her and he she'd been there a few times when uh, when they were fighting and he'd jump on top of her and beat her and and just all kinds of crazy stuff. Well. That was pretty much all they had to throw out there. And the judge slaps the gavel and binds it over to the grand jury, which means that he finds that there's ample cause to uh, bind the case over for trial. So after the, after the hearing, I'm sitting in my office, which, which uh, was not far from the, from the courthouse, and I get a little knock on the, wind, on the door, and I answer the door. And... Uh, these two old, older people, they're, they're probably in their mid 70s or early 70s come to the door and it was his mother and father. And just the sweetest people you ever wanted to meet. They were middle, you know, upper middle class. They had, uh, I believe he was the youngest of four children. They had two sons and they had a daughter and him. And uh, two of their sons worked for uh, NSA in Virginia you know, that spy stuff that Snowden used to do. But anyway, they came down and, and talked to me for a while and, and I, you know, they were just they were just heartbroken. You know, he had a, a daughter by another wife that was, I think she was about eight or 10. And, you know, this, this kid's gonna grow up without a father. And it was just, you know, for me, it was just heartbreaking. And, and we sat there and we talked for about an hour and uh, they left and I started thinking, I said, there's got to be more to this case. There's got to, got to be more, more that I can do because second degree murder carries a sentence of about 20 to 27 years. They usually end up serving about 18. And to me, hello, to me, this was, hey buddy, you gonna come with me, huh? <laughs> Little dog's getting after me, He's sniffing my feet. But uh, this was, to me, there had to be more. I had to do more for these people than, than just let that slide. And uh, so I sat down with, with uh, my crime scene guy and we looked over the documents. We looked over the statement. We watched her statement again and uh, sitting there. And a lot of times when you mull things over three or four different times, you can get a better outlook at it. And that's what we did. And I thought, you know, in order to prove premeditation on a murder, you have to prove that they had pre-thoughts to commit the murder. You know, second degree murder is when you, when you grab a gun and shoot somebody. Premeditated murder is where you plan it, where you, where you have forethought to plan out the murder. And it basically carries a life sentence. And I kept looking at ways to prove it in this case. And I thought, there's got to be, there's got to be something. And you know, I wanted to do it for the family. You know, the brothers came down and, and they were just really nice people. Uh, you know, I talked to them for a while and, and uh, sister came over and, and, and talked to me. And just great people. Well, I started thinking about it and I took the case to the grand jury as it was and i presented to the presented it to the grand jury which is a 12 member panel that hears basically the same thing the first judge heard and they make a determination 
whether the case will go on to trial or not, whether you have enough evidence, whether there's you know probable cause to believe that she committed the crime, and, and really they look at whether there's a good chance that you're going to be able to convict the person. And it's a good system. I mean, I, uh, I always said I could probably get a rabbit indicted for murder if I wanted to or, or whatever, you know, with a grand jury. Because, it, you know, it's not, it's not a formal type thing. You don't have several people coming in and testifying. Usually it's just the officer that's prosecuting the case. And uh, anyway, I presented it to the grand jury. And sure enough, two weeks later, they come down with a, an indictment for second degree murder. And which, you know, I was happy. Uh, you know, I thought about it, but I thought there's got to be more to this case. There's got to be more that I could do. And I didn't stop. I just kept digging and digging and digging. And then it dawned on me. I was looking at the crime scene photos, and I keep seeing his gun on top of the, the dresser in a holster. And when we found the gun on the bed, it wasn't in a holster. There was no holster in, in the bedroom to be found. And I'm thinking, that pretty much proves, you know, if I can prove that that gun was in a holster, and it was removed from the holster in the house, that, uh, you know, that pretty much says that when she got up from the, from the couch to go to the house, her intentions wasn't to return that gun, her intentions were to come back and shoot him. And the crime scene said that, you know, my best scenario of what happened was she came in the room, had the gun out, and shot him in the chest. He turns around, falls on the floor, and then she stands over and, and pumps one in him. Now, when we find the gun on the bed, it's jammed. So, had it not jammed, I'll bet you there probably would have been three or four holes in the in the uh, in his body. She probably would have emptied the gun into him. But uh, my thing was. If I could prove that that gun was in a holster when she got it, and I have a real good chance of, of getting first degree murder. And the prosecutor in this case, a sweet lady from, from Wisconsin, one of the best prosec uh, prosecutors I've ever worked with. And uh, I called her up and started talking to her and explaining it to her. And uh, she's now a, a judge. She retired from, from being a prosecutor and she's now a criminal court judge, which uh, was interesting. And as a matter of fact, she uses this case in her, uh, she teaches at the, at the college, criminal justice. And she uses this, ca this case as an example to uh, police officers to, to get them to look further than what they're actually seeing. But uh, anyway, I explain it to her, you know, what I think. And uh, she's in agreement. She says, I think you've got, got enough there to, to uh, prove premeditation. So, but the main thing was the holster. Okay, we had a battery go dead, so I just changed batteries out. But the, the main thing was the holster. If I could prove that that gun is normally kept in a holster, I'd have the case. So... I remember her friend, his friend, telling me he was present when she, when he gave her the gun. So I called, called him up and had him come in, and I got a statement from him. And I didn't bait him. Uh, I just, you know, he told me the story about the gun, and and uh, I asked him. I said, "Well, how was the gun given to her?" He says it was in a brown leather holster. He, I said, "You sure?" And he said, yeah, I'm absolutely sure. Brian kept all of his guns in holsters. And that matched, you know, what we saw on the, on the dresser. So I'm thinking, you know, this is good. You know, this proves my point that she killed him. She killed him on purpose. So I call up the, uh, the prosecutor and I tell him, I've got proof that, you know, when she was given the gun, it was in a holster. Now, when she shot him, it was out of the holster. And uh, she told me to go ahead and present it again. So I went back to the grand jury. This is about a month later. Things are, you know, things are kind of moving along. And uh, I presented it to the grand jury again. This time I brought in the premeditation part of it. And they also brought out 
the, the, the prosecutor was in the grand jury room and she also brought out the part that she failed to render any aid to him after she shot him. And to me, you know, this, this wasn't really an evidence point, but for a point of law, it, it, it carried a lot of weight. So, sure enough, two weeks later, they, they re-indict her on first-degree murder. And uh, I was hoping they would re-arrest her. And uh, she would have had to, she, well, she, she actually, I don't think the judge would have put a bond on a first-degree murder charge. Or it would have been one so high that she wouldn't have been able to, her family wouldn't have been able to make it. Well, she was able to make the bond, or she was able to just walk in and the judge changed, amended the charges to first-degree murder, and she was able to stay on the same bond. The trial date was set for two months off and uh, there was a lot of work that I still had to do on the case. And one of the things that I learned through interviewing all these people was that the victim got along real well with the suspect's father. He was the guy in the hospital with cancer, but he was home from the hospital. And uh, my partner and I were, we're, con we're gonna go talk to him. So we drove down the street and, pulled up in front of the house and knocked on the door and he's sitting in a, in a sofa right in the doorway. You know, he invites us in and uh, I said, uh, you know, I told him who I was and told him why I was there and I said, I said, did you know Brian? He said, yeah. He said, I knew him. I said, do you ever have any problems with him? He said, no, no, we, we got along fine. And uh, I said, well, did you ever hear, ever see him beat up on your daughter? And he said, no, I just heard about it. I, I never saw it. And, uh, you know, it may have happened. I, I just never saw it. And he was, you know, he was probably in his mid-70s. He was coherent, you know. I mean, he, he was on an oxygen machine and stuff, and he was talking to me fine. And about that time, she comes flying, she comes flying out of that one of the back bedrooms, just cursing and hollering and yelling at me and my partner, get the hell out, get, get gone, and don't ever come back here. Well... I pretty much had what I wanted, so I just walked out the door, got in my car, and, and we, Barry and I were kind of laughing about it all the way back to the jail. I get to get in my office, and I'm not there about five minutes, and the phone starts ringing. Well, it's her attorney, and he's just giving me go, the go around. He said, you can't talk to them. You can't do this well. I stopped him short. I can't, I can't talk to his client, but I can talk to anybody else. And he can't tell me who I can talk to in the family and who I can't. And uh, we had some very, very choice words and I ended up slamming the phone down on him and I, I can't repeat what I said. Uh, but he got, he got the point across. Well, I interview his, his wife, his, his second wife, that he had divorced to hook up with this girl for the second time. And it turns out I knew her. And she was a teller at a bank that, uh, that I did business with. I've known her for years. And uh, I met her up there and started talking to her. I said, was he ever violent with you? And she says, no, never. We had arguments. She said, one time I, I scratched his face up with, with my keys. I was so mad at him. And uh, he never reacted. He just stood there and took it. Hello. And uh, just he's never ever done anything that would make me think that he was he was violent and I never found anybody that said he was everybody said he was just a meek minor you know meek mannered person uh, everybody liked him except for her and uh, you know it just uh, the pieces weren't fitting so from there I went back I had already interviewed the ex-boyfriend one time and basically got the statement from him. He, you know, he, he didn't lie. He didn't, he didn't make anything up. He said, she called me frantic and, you know, I couldn't get her off the phone and I finally had to hang the phone up on her so I could call 911. And, uh, you know, he admitted to, to having a relationship with him that the, the deceased husband was jealous of and, and they had had words a few times. But, uh, and that was the end of it. That was pretty much my contact with him. 
So when it get, came time for trial, and the trial took, it was probably about eight or nine months later that we actually had a trial. And this is really the, the, the fun part of the whole story. Uh, I've pretty much got everything lined on my case and I've got all my witnesses coming in and we had subpoenaed the, the, the people from the crime lab. And Oh, and by the way, the crime lab did confirm that the bullets in the body were the same ones that were from the gun. Uh, they also said when they examined his clothing, they, uh, they estimated that uh, he, she was standing anywhere from three to four feet to five feet away from him based on the tattooing on the, on his, the powder tattooing on his clothes in the front. And on the back, they figured two to three feet at the most. So, you know, that pretty much sewed up that she stood over his body while he was laying there on the floor and, and, uh, and pumped one in him. But anyway, we get ready for trial and I start rounding up witnesses and I, I get the ex-boyfriend and, and all that and we get ready for trial. The day of the trial comes, they, he postpones it. The, the defense attorney postpones it. He's in the hospital getting his uh, wisdom teeth pulled out. So another two weeks went by. They, you know, they set another date. Another two weeks went by, and then he had something else come up, and I had to postpone it again. So it was about a month and a half we had to wait before we went to trial. And uh, the day of the trial comes. Everybody's there. She's there. She's out on bond. Uh, all the witnesses show up. You know, everything, everything's looking good. Well, we get to jury selection. And when the trial's going on, I'm sitting in the courtroom with the two, there were two prosecuting attorneys. Uh, one was the lady, uh, Sandra, and then there was another guy by the name of John who was kind of her, her, uh, her helper. And he was also a prosecutor. And I sat down at the end of the table and we started, you know, the judge comes in. He, the judge was a good friend of mine too. <laughs> and, uh, we start going through the jury pool, and the courtroom was packed. And uh, they start interviewing people, you know, and they're kicking them off one by one. And they get to this one guy, and uh, he had hair, blonde hair, about down to his waist. He was probably probably early 40s, uh, jeans, you know, kind of like a work type shirt on. And they start asking him questions. Well, it turns out he was a, uh, he had a concealed weapons permit. And he had been out one day and apparently he forgot his permit or something like that. And the, and the city police stopped him and they arrested him. And, you know, when he turned up with his permit, you know, they dismissed the charges against him and expunged the record. And, you know, I listened to it, and I didn't, uh, I kind of looked beyond that. I looked at a man who was experienced with guns and carried one, just like my victim. And the, uh, the long hair didn't bother me, you know. Obviously, he had a job. He was married and had, like, three kids. And uh, her attorney gets up, and he's, he's smiling, you know. I mean, he's just he's loving this guy. And he says to the guy, he says, well, you've been arrested. He said, so you would, you would have to agree that sometimes police officers make mistakes. Guy shakes his head, yeah, yeah. He says, I'll agree with that. Everybody's human. Everybody makes mistakes. And uh, he pretty much asked the question that, you know, the prosecutor was going to ask him. You know, would you have uh, any problems in this case, you know, finding for a not guilty verdict if, if you found out that the officers had made a mistake? He said, no. And uh, I looked over at Sandra and I looked over at John and they're both shaking their heads, no. They don't want this guy on the jury. And they're gonna kick him. And I said, no, don't kick him. Leave him on the jury. They're saying, you're crazy, Bill. I said, leave him on the jury, trust me. And one of the things that I have learned as a cop is 
Sometimes you see things and you need to look beyond those things and look at the core. And that's what I saw in this guy. I saw he was a working man. He knew guns. Uh, he, had, he wasn't, he, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't trashy or anything. He just liked to wear his hair long. Well, you know, if I wasn't a cop, I might have had my hair down to my waist too. But uh, anyway, I told them to leave him on and they said, you sure? And I said, yes, please leave him on. And uh, they, went, they went ahead with my, my choice and they left him on the jury. Well, we started our case and uh, we started the, they picked the jury and we started the trial and, and the first person to testify was the TBI crime lab, or actually, I'm sorry, it was the first officer on the scene, and, which was uh, a guy by the name of Terry, shift lieutenant. And he testifies that, you know, he, he responded to the scene, found the guy dead on the floor, and then the medical examiner testifies that, you know, the death and talks about the gunshot wounds and, you know, what he thought as far as the, uh, the shot in the back. They put... Uh, The uh, crime scene technicians from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, they put them on the stand and they basically testify about the, the distance of the gun. Uh, what else did they testify? You know, the ballistics and, and all that good stuff. Hello. And, you know, everything was running smooth. And then they came to me. Well, they put, they put uh, before me, they put on the friend. And he testified about the holster, and he testified that the guy had, you know, the victim had stayed at his house several times, and um, he had come 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 over there with scratches and bruises all over him. Um, just a number of different things that he testified to, but the main thing that I wanted him to testify to was that he was present when he gave her the gun, and it was in a brown holster. Now, hindsight. I should have got a search warrant for that holster. Uh, I should have. Why I didn't, I don't know. It's just one of those things that I just, I just overlooked. Uh, more than likely, if I'd have walked back into the kitchen on the search warrant, that, holster, that empty holster would have been on top of the refrigerator and I would have had a cod lock case on her. But I didn't do it. But anyway, he testifies to it. And uh, then I take the witness stand and I, I basically explain, how, you know, going there, what I saw, you know, what I found, and, and then they played the the uh, the confession tape where she where she talks about it. And he, you know, he, he asked me a few questions, but uh, not a lot. You know, he 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 didn't ask me a you know, some things that I expected to be asked. But uh, anyway, I get off the witness stand and then he calls up the ex, or she calls up the ex-boyfriend to explain about the call and that she got from him and uh, how, uh, how he was actually had to be the one to call, call law enforcement. Well, the defense attorney, it's his turn to question this guy. He gets up. And his first line of questioning is, is uh, what did Bill Burt do to pressure you into testifying? And the guy's just got, got this kind of square look on his face. You know, he just looks kind of dumbfounded. And he says, nothing. And uh, <laughs> then he goes on to uh, say, well, you were just arrested by the drug task force about three or four weeks ago, weren't you? And the guy says, yeah. And he said, uh, what were you arrested for? He says, well, possession of methamphetamine. So then he starts making the in, uh, accusations that I had the drug task force set this guy up to put pressure on him. The judge just flies off his, out of his chair. He's, he's really upset and he, he sends the jury out and uh, the two, two, the prosecutor and the attorneys are both arguing, and I mean, there was absolutely, I didn't even know the guy had been arrested. Uh, so they have a closed hearing, and the prosecutor gets up, gets up there first, and she starts talking to him. She goes, did Bill Bird ever pressure you or, or talk bad to you or do anything to you? 
He says, no. He says, I haven't seen Bill since the time he came to my house and interviewed me. He says, as a matter of fact, I saw him right before court here and he bought me a Coke. And the judge just starts laughing. And this guy, this attorney is sitting over there just chomping at his teeth. And he gets up, goes through his routine again about the conspiracy that I, I had the guy set up by the drug task force. I didn't even know who the drug task force guys were at that time. Uh, you know, it was just bullshit. And uh, so after that, they decided to take a break. And we're, we're, we're pretty much done anyway. We pretty much had put all our witnesses on. And uh, the judge at that time has, a, has the opportunity to, uh, to close the case out there and, and, and render a directed verdict of not guilty. And the, you know, the defense attorney, he, he got up and argued it, and the, you know, the prosecutor got up and argued it, and it lasted about 10 minutes, and that was the end of it. And then we broke. And uh, when I had lunch, we come back from lunch, and uh, they start their case. Well, the first person that they put up on the witness stand is the mother. And I had already testified that I had subpoenaed the records from all the hospitals in town to see if she had ever been assaulted or ever reported being assaulted. I, subpoen I found out who her doctor was. I subpoenaed records from her doctor and they all came back, no, there wasn't anything. But anyway, the mother gets up there and says that he used to beat her, broke her nose, and you know, blackened her eyes and all kinds of stuff. Just, just crazy stuff. And, you know, the prosecutor gets up and questions her and, you know, kind of asks her in detail. And you could tell she didn't have answers for the questions. And they ended up, she got off the witness stand and came back down. They had her ex-husband testify. And he, he was a real dirtbag. And he gets up and testifies that during their marriage, he beat the shit out of her. And he actually says this on the witness stand. The judge about goes off on him. And uh, he says, oh, I used to beat her. And, you know, she just had a rough life and, and, and all that. Well, it really didn't have any bearing on, on my case other than what they were gearing up to do. So uh, the next witness they call is a psychologist. And this is... This was the best thing I had ever seen in my life happen in the courtroom. The psychologist gets up there and testifies about her competency to stand trial. And uh, he testifies that, you know, she does know right from wrong. She can, uh, you know, she can assist in her defense. And, you know, he doesn't think that at the time of the crime that she didn't know what was right and wrong. She did. And, uh, it stops right there and then they start asking about her background well the first thing that this their the background investigation that he did in her past well two things happened here in a court case the prosecution anything that they're going to enter the prosecution and the defense anything that they're going to enter into evidence they have to supply to the other attorney anything that we did we had to give to them Anything that they were going to bring up in court, they had to give us long before the trial. The uh, slick defense attorney, he thought he was going to pull a fast one. And uh, all he did was send over the, uh, the part of the examination where she was competent to stand trial. But this doctor had done an evaluation of her in her past, her background, and her marriage with him. Well, she, he starts getting up testifying about what the ex-husband was like. You know, how he beat her and, you know, all this. Well, they just, you know, the whole, both, you know, the, the prosecutor just stopped him right there on the tracks and the judge is kind of leaning back in his chair. And uh, again, they take the jury out. And what this guy, what this, attorney had tried to do is he had to try to get this doctor to testify that uh, the victim had, had been very abusive and beat her several times and the guy was you know just bad well that's all hearsay evidence that's not admissible and, and number two is you couldn't do that because it hadn't been presented to the uh, to the prosecution prior to the trial I mean he just sprung it on us well, the judge 
sits back and he listens to both their arguments. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm thinking, this, this, ain't, this isn't going to go well for, for them. And sure enough, other than her competence, the judge ruled that the doctor couldn't testify to anything. He, uh, he had a file on his, on his lap that was probably the size of a phone book. No telling how much money they paid him. And uh, the judge, judge excused him, called the jury back in. Another dead battery, we're back again. But anyway, the judge instructs the jury to disallow anything that the doctor said past the point of where she was competent to stand trial. And this guy got up off the witness stand and with, his, with his book and kind of stormed off. And I, they probably paid that doctor probably four or $5,000. Uh, and it basically just walked out the door with them. So we took a break then. And uh, the judge called for a 30 minute recess while everybody just kind of chilled out a little bit and the jury was, you know, was kind of relaxed a little bit. And uh, I'm standing over at the prosecution table. The, everybody's pretty much left the courtroom and, and uh, the jury is gone, the judge is gone, and the cop walks up to me, or the, the defense attorney walks up to me. And I cussed him out. And right there, I said, I said, you know, you had absolutely no evidence that I had forced that guy or coerced that guy to make a statement. And I said, you want to bring it up in court? I said, that's extremely bad. And I said, that's just, just a, a, hello, just a crappy attorney, crappy attorney work, you know, it's just pitiful. And uh, he said, oh, you're being unprofessional. I said, bullshit. I said, you're the one that's unprofessional. I said, you're, you're, you're you're beyond unprofessional. And I walked out. I walked back into the, uh, the chambers that were to the door to the left. And we, uh, we went downstairs, got a drink and stuff. And uh, I was with the, the two prosecutors and, and also the family was there too. And so I go back inside the, the courtroom. This is about 30 minutes later. And he kind of waddled the defense attorney kind of waddles up to me, you know, and he says, um, you know, he says, I apologize for, for, for reacting like that. And, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I just kind of shook my head. He says, what, what kind of an offer will you make her? And that's, it's common to do that in a trial. You know, if it really doesn't look like a slam dunk, they'll, they'll, they'll ask for an offer. And a lot of times we'll give them one, you know, cause we don't know how that jury is going to turn. It takes one person to hang a jury. And, uh, you know, oftentimes we'll, uh, we'll roll with the punches. It's kind of ironic. I'm right in front of the old woman's prison. But uh, I told him, I said, well, let me go talk to the family and talk to the prosecutors. And the family was in the next room. So I walked in and talked to the, uh, the father and the mother and the two brothers were there. And I said, you know, here's the thing and the prosecutor in this case really let me you know do what I felt was right and uh, you know the prosecutor said no we're not gonna we're not gonna offer her anything but I talked to them and I said here here's the here's the situation we're in we're going for first-degree murder which is gonna be a life sentence uh, hello and uh, we could lose I said, if she pleads guilty to second degree murder, she's gonna serve at least 18 years in the penitentiary. That's where guaranteed. And, uh, you know, they kind of looked at it and they said, what do you think, Bill? I said, well, based on what I've seen happen in the past, you never know what a jury's gonna do. I'd say, go ahead and take it. You know, go ahead and let's go ahead and make that offer. And uh, they were agreements, they understood. They weren't heartbroken or anything like that. And uh, prosecutor was agreeing, agreeing with it, because that would have ended the trial right there. She'd have been found guilty, and uh, she'd have been sentenced right there. Uh, so I go back out into the court, you know, the courtroom, and I bring him in, bring the defense attorney back in, and uh, I said, "We'll give her second degree. She pleads guilty to second degree." And uh, they can have a sentencing hearing and, and uh, pre-trial pre hearings and investigations and, and go from there. 
And he said, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll offer that to her. And uh, I was sitting there thinking, I said, I bet she don't take it. She's real cocky. And uh, he comes back in and uh, about 30 minutes later, I could see him over there talking there. Both him and his assistants are talking to her like, uh, uh, like no tomorrow. And she's just sitting there shaking her head and I knew, I knew it. He comes walking over and says, she's not gonna take it, she's gonna roll the dice. She thinks, uh, she, you know, we think we've got a good case. And I said, go ahead, roll the dice. And uh, things went on, they had, uh, they had a couple of character witnesses for her, and then the only person left to testify about the abuse was her. And the last thing a defense attorney wants to do is put their witness on, or their, their, uh, their client on the witness stand. Well, buddy, he didn't have any choice because uh, the good old doctor could not testify to the abuse, and she was the only one that could. And uh, he put her up on the stand, and they went through all the whole routine. The, they, they reenacted the shooting on the on the floor and in front of the, the jury box. And you know, I had pretty much explained my my point of view, and, and they were just the jury wasn't even paying attention to her. Uh, they just pretty much uh, had discounted just about everything she was saying. And uh, then the the prosecutor gets hold of her and really just does an excellent job of discrediting everything that she says about uh, domestic violence over the years. And then she brings up uh, the ex-boyfriend. And this is something that I didn't know. The, the prosecutor had found this out. The, she had gone to, to a place about 300 miles from, from her hometown and she had got stuck. And she didn't have any money to get home. She'd gone there to see a guy. And she calls her ex-boyfriend to, to wire her money to get home. She tells him that uh, she was, she was uh, over there seeing some friends. Turns out she's over there seeing a man. And when, uh, when she said that on the witness stand, I kind of looked over at him and his, his eyes just rolled. Because he, he drove over and gave her the money to get back. And it, just, it, just, it was just a cluster from that point on. I mean, it just, their case was just dissolving. Well, he finishes with her. And uh, they rest their case. And the jury, the judge charges the jury. And uh, they retire to, uh, to render a verdict. Now, most of the time, in most of the cases that I've worked, in that, you know, that, that type of charges, the jury would take anywhere from two days to three days to render a verdict. And, uh, you know, we gathered up our stuff and, and uh, you know, all shook hands and, and uh, all the witnesses kind of took off. And I said, well, I said, I'm going to go home and have something to eat. If anything happens, just call me, you know, which is not uncommon. A lot of times we, you know, while the jury's out, we'd go run errands. Heck, we'd go, go work other cases and stuff. So I got in my car and uh, I get to... Uh, I get halfway home and my phone starts ringing. Now, I'm, I only live about 16, 17 miles from the, from the courthouse. My phone starts ringing, I pick it up and it's the uh, prosecutor, she goes, they're back. And I said, oh no, this isn't good. You know, that's just too quick. Never, ever had one go that quick on a, on a first degree murder case. And uh, I, said, I said, I'm on my way. And I just, I whipped the car around in the middle of the, the road there and started headed back just as fast as I could. I bailed out of my car in front of the courthouse and uh, ran up the stairs and, and uh, came in the back door of the courtroom. And uh, the two prosecutors are sitting there looking at me and I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting. I'm just, you know, it's just like, you, you know, like your kid opening up a Christmas present. You want to know what the hell it is. And uh, the judge is talking and I looked down and I kind of leaned over to, to uh, Sandra put my, my head down and she goes, guilty first degree murder. And shoo. I was just shocked, you know. I, I looked over at her and she had this look on her face of just gloom, you know, and just 
crazy. And, and when I sat down, the prosecutor leans over and says, Bill, the guy that you wanted to throw off the jury? I said, yeah, because he was the foreman of the jury. He got up and stood up and pointed his finger at her, called her name and told her she was guilty of first degree murder. And I just about freaked. I said, there you go. Oops, I just walked back here. I'm going to shut this off and walk the other direction. Okay, we're back walking again. Yeah. It just, uh, it floored me. It absolutely floored me. Uh, I, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. And there was no, uh, she was taken right out of the courtroom. And as a matter of fact, I walked her down to the patrol car. <laughs> you know, I just, I just wanted that, that feeling of, of slamming the door, you know, and, uh, I, you know, it was, it was just a good feeling. I, I'd won. I'd won for the victim. I'd won for the parents. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I won for the, the guy's daughter that's going to grow up without a father. And uh, I felt good about it. I walked her, like I said, I walked her down to the, to the patrol car. And <laughs> it's so funny. I mean, I, I must have a big heart. I, I, I don't know. But anyway... There's a, probably about five or six uniformed officers standing around, and they're, they're walking kind of around me and behind me. And I go to put her in the patrol car, and we're downstairs in, in the basement of the courthouse. And she goes, can I smoke a cigarette? And I thought, I said, it's going to be a long time before you ever get to smoke another cigarette. I'll let you smoke a cigarette. So I gave her a cigarette and she stood out beside the patrol car and smoked it, and finished it and put it out and got in the car and I slammed the door and off she went. She was uh, 36 years old at the time. They sentenced her to life in prison. And in the st state of Tennessee, that means 51 years. Or 50, I'm sorry, 57 years she got. No parole, no possibility of parole. And uh, I figured it out yesterday when I was kind of doing some research. I wanted to find some of the old articles and, and, and that were in the paper and I couldn't find them. But uh, she'll be 93 years old when she gets, gets out of jail if she doesn't die first. Now, the picture of her that I put up doesn't look like what she looked like back then. Uh, she was very attractive, took care of herself. Uh, you know, <laughs> prison life's been, been rough on her, and it needed to be. But uh, that day justice was served, and I felt real good about it. The, the case has survived every appeal that they've made. Um, and I, I may leave, leave links in the description to some of the appeals that they made that were ruled upon by the judges but uh, she had claimed uh, inadequate counsel which heck she probably could have won that one you know he wasn't worth a flip and uh, he went on to be a just a trash ball attorney that you know kept filing uh, wrongful death suits against the sheriff's department and the police departments down there and he uh, just nobody that you would you would ever think would have been an, an ex-policeman but uh, she's in, uh, I believe it's Morgan County, if I'm not, not mistaken, Correctional Institute. I'm not really sure exactly which one, but she's not in a pleasant place, and she won't be getting out for a good long time, which is nice. Well, I'm going to end the video here. I appreciate it if you lasted this long. I hope you enjoyed the story. Please leave me some comments. And uh, if you like the video, click like. If you like stories like this, subscribe to the channel. There'll be more. I think the next uh, next one I'm going to do, I may do a story about the night I met James Earl Ray, the, uh, the man that shot Martin Luther King. But anyway, y'all have a good day. I'm going to go find the air conditioner, get something to drink, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye.